I am Sonia Bleker, Learning Experience Facilitator at Partos. Um, yeah, I'm a white woman, uh, darkish, blonde, long hair, wearing a black jacket and a pinkish uh, shirt underneath. Um, well, and Partos, it's the membership body for Dutch international development organizations. So we unite uh, over 100 yeah, civil society organizations in the Netherlands. And uh, well, at Partos, we have our, our learning and innovation program called the Innovation Hub. And well, I believe in line with efforts of IACSC and many other development actors at the Innovation Hub, we work hard with our members to learn and innovate to well balance powers, power relations in development partnerships, decolonize the sector. And I strongly believe that you no know, reinventing the roles and ways of working in the sector to become more equal, more inclusive, more resilient is something very urgent, uh, especially looking at the many development challenges and also closing civic spaces all over the world. Um, and one thing that, that we need to do is to learn from innovators in the global south, you know, who are pioneering those approaches based on local resources, local power. Uh, and that's why I'm very, very happy that um, while the Partos ICSC collaboration took place for this report and we're able to launch uh, the report today. Um, yeah, at Partos, we are organizing a second launch and learning event next week, Tuesday, the 28th, in which we also focus on the lessons and insights for INGOs together with representatives of Yum Indonesia and the Kenya Community Development Foundation. I will make sure the invitation reaches you. If you are uh, inspired today, you're welcome to join. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, this session and give, well, a big thanks to all those that collaborated and made the report and the session today possible. So thank you. And I hand over to one of the Miriams. Thank you, Sonia. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Miriam Chizagambini, and I'm the manager of the Accelerate Inclusive Partnership Project at the International Civil Society Center. And today, I have the pleasure to present to you the report and to share some of the recommendations and insights that we gathered. The uh, innovation report, the Power of Making Futures report, uh, creates nine locally led uh, initiatives that innovatively challenge the power asymmetries uh, that are present still in the international development and social justice sectors, and also foster local innovations ecosystem um, across geographies. I will now share my screen to tell you more about the report. Um, the report is part of our tradition, as Miriam mentioned at the beginning, around promoting innovation and really providing insights for civil society practitioners that could help them unlock their potential, uh, think about approaching the work differently, especially uh, with the common uh, challenges that we are facing, especially in times of poly crisis. As part of the debate and discussions around shifting power, as in to really move the power from where it's still uh, located in, in power centers in the global north to leadership in the global south, we really wanted to focus around different approaches. And so look at not just that funding or strategy or operations, but really try to provide an overview of how uh, power shift is being uh, approached by different organizations and focus particularly on Global South organizations. As part of our work at the center and particularly within the Accelerate Inclusive Power Shift project, we worked around promoting governance and equitable partnerships and work with other actors in the system to really uh, support advocacy towards change enablers and really influence change. And as part of that work, we have had also the privilege in the last few years to focus on innovation and to really explore different innovative approaches and future fit also was particularly for international civil society organizations and really moving beyond the global north south binary that still exists in the sector. Therefore, it made uh, really sense for us to be aligning and having the chance to connect with the Innovation Hub from Partos because we really wanted to focus on innovation and really look at two main questions. The first one is who really defines uh, innovation in international uh, civil society and what are some of the voices that we are missing from the discourse? 
And ultimately, the objective for us was also to really challenge the uh, fallacy and assumption that innovation comes mostly from the global north. So through the report, we had the chance to really recognize uh, pioneers and innovators from the global south and to encourage the sharing and adoption of some of the approaches that these great organizations have implemented and to really enhance the awareness that there are different ways of doing things and to uh, work around promoting local leadership and ownership and encourage more initiatives around shifting power. We focus particularly on three teams because, again, we really wanted to provide an overview of the different approaches to shift in power. And we thought it was important to really look also at the power dynamics in narrative and imagery. So uh, acknowledging the fact that the sector is still arrived with, uh, with very harmful depictions of communities uh, that we work with and to really challenge these dynamics and challenge these narratives. Then we looked at uh, participatory funding models, so emerging approaches to funding that really try to promote more equitable ways of working and of sharing of resources. And finally, we looked at innovative approaches to development cooperation, and we focused particularly around South-South collaboration uh, in different facets of these projects. In terms of methodology, uh, we had really the pleasure to uh, do some deep research together with our research partner, Includivate, which is a decolonized research incubator, to really look at different uh, innovations. And we used a particular framework that understands innovation as really disrupting traditional approaches and really assisting in the idea of power sharing and shifting power, and particularly wanted to understand if one particular project was uh, identifying a new problem and finding a solution for an existing problem. And we focus particularly on locally led innovations. So this year we really were keen to make sure that we highlighted the work of those uh, that are still underrepresented in the, in the innovation discourse and really look at how they are implementing different uh, ideas around shifting power. So as part of that uh, methodology, we really developed an iterative process of co-creation together with the case studies organizations and through key format interviews and revision of documents and really background research that would also inform more around the topic that some of these projects are trying to address. I just want to briefly uh, share some of the recommendations that we think are really could be useful for organizations that decide that they want to approach the work differently. Uh, you will have the chance today to hear from some of the great case studies organizations that we created, uh, and then also you will receive after the event the report, so we'll have the chance to really deep dive into the, the case studies. Um, some of the recommendations uh, that were presented were around uh, supporting creative professionals from the Global South uh, that, are, that are promoting the uh, ownership of their narratives and really address the fake narratives that still exist around the global south. Uh, then also to promote uh, novel grant making processes, so really thinking out of the box and uh, out of what is considered standard in terms of uh, grant making processes, and also to support uh, uh, local organizations in their partnerships and promote more equitable uh, partnerships and really also encouraging community participation beyond uh, financial contributions. We then also uh, gather more insights around the importance of establishing inclusive governance structures and really enhance community representation when partnering with one organization particularly to really uh, promote more advocacy for donors to integrate community generated indicators in their um, monitoring and reporting and to really try to enforce the idea that ultimately monitoring and reporting does not have to be dictated with indicators from the global north and finally, to assist community-based organizations with job want accountability and with feedback uh, mechanisms that can avoid uh, elite capture. So in conclusion, uh, we have really had the chance to see how many organizations are really eager uh, to uh, reshape the traditional ways of working and top-down frameworks that exist 
and that there is a lot of emphasis around approaching that both on the day-to-day -day basis in terms of the operations of the work, but also in general, more theoretical basis to really truly influence uh, decision-making and power. And that uh, ultimately we're all in this together. We all believe that the sector has to change and that there is a concerted effort from all actors to really rethink and work around a completely different uh, ecosystem for international development and social justice where there is more equity. I will now stop here because it would be great to now finally hear from also our case studies partners that have uh, decided today to, to join us and you will hear from them more about the innovations that, have, that they have produced. So I will now uh, happily give the word to our moderator for today, Adriana Sosa, who is the Vice President of the World Board of World WCA and Project Coordinator at World WCA 18. Uh, Adriana uh, has been uh, a board member of the World WCA since 2019 and is currently serving a second term as Vice President, representing the region of the Caribbean. Her work is primarily centered on implementing projects aimed at preventing and addressing gender-based violence for girls and young women coming from increasingly at-risk communities of the metropolitan region of Pichonville and its surroundings. So now, without further ado, I would like to give the word to Adriana. Thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to be here today and to have the privilege of moderating this discussion. For those of you who may not be able to see me, I am a brown Latina girl from Haiti. I have brown curly hair and brown eyes, and I am currently wearing a black t-shirt. Today, we have the pleasure of listening to our distinguished panelists coming from different regions across the globe, as well as different sectors across the civil society and media. And they will share with us a bit in regards to their journeys and the tremendous work fostering locally led innovative initiatives, challenging power imbalances within the international development and social justice sector. First, we have Anne Mora, co-founder of the Lam Sisterhood, a feminist content studio operating in Kenya that follows a feminist approach in storytelling and puts women at the center of their work to reclaim the stories challenging power dynamics in inherent historical representations of African women. Next, we have Pamina Fershaw, the executive director of Everyday Peace Indicators, who operates globally. EPI focuses on challenging traditional Western-led MNE practices through models such as the GAM model that develop community-created indicators through a participatory approach adapted to fit various social contexts and needs. And finally, we have Gloria Mugabikazi, Program Officer from Uhai Eshri, which is the East African Sexual Health, Sexual and Reproductive Health Initiative, operating in East Africa. Uhai plays a dual role as both an activist fund and participant and excuse me, both an activist fund and funder. And they follow a feminist and participatory approach to funding providing funding flexibility and a voice to LGBTQI plus movement. And Pamina Gloria, as we go through the questions, please make sure to briefly describe yourselves before answering to be mindful and inclusive of all those who have joined us today on this webinar. With this, I open the panel with a first question to you, Anne. And here we're going to talk about media and the importance of feminist storytelling. So within a sector that is still rife with harmful narratives um, in regards to Africa, and particularly in regards to African women, where they are too often mar marginalized or only depicted as beneficiaries or victims, what has been your experience engaging in feminist storytelling through the Alam Sisterhood to center African women in their own representation? Thank you so much for the question. Hello, everyone. Um, for the description, I'm Anne Mora. I use the pronouns she, her, and um, I am a black woman with braids that look like dreadlocks, a yellow scarf, and one of my favorite white earrings. <laughs> so, um, right, when it comes to media and representation and our experience of the Lamb Sisterhood, 
Um, so when when we talk about this, I think it's really important to start where we began, um, because for us, the impulse to do feminist storytelling wasn't an abstracted idea or, you know, developed in a pitch room. It was something that came from a deep and personal impulse as Kenyan feminists. So in 2018, one of our partners reached out and said, for my birthday, I want to gift myself this different women's stories because I am really hungry for stories that say that you can, that people before you have done this work, that you're not just running around and trying to create new things all the time, that you're not the first woman in this world to try and change it. And so we spent nine months researching on invisible women in Kenyan history. I found people who were never mentioned in my education, formal or informal. And from that, we developed a play. And that play was sold out multiple times. It won awards. And in that process, we realized that for ourselves, telling these stories was a personal need that a lot of people had as well. That was the feedback we got from our audience. So we began by understanding that we weren't the only people who are hungry for African women's stories. Um, at that point, after the play success, we and we recognized the need, we decided, hmm, what is this something that is viable? And because we're speaking specifically in the international civil service sector, I wanted to share that um, for our context, we're a limited liability company for a couple of different reasons. One, um, there's re it's very there's no regulatory framework to register a social enterprise that's interested in impact over profit. And so you're going to find a lot of, um, anyone who's working in the space will find that within Kenya, and I think for a lot of Africa, there'll be a lot of organizations registered as limited liability companies who are actually doing impact work because of reason two, which is the regulatory hurdles to register a nonprofit versus the for-profit company. In Kenya, it takes about two weeks to a month to register a for-profit company, and the systems excluding the new finance acts are relatively simple to follow and understand, whereas I, whereas NGOs take about a year and require a different level of administration and work. So for you to even begin the work, we kind of made the first, what's the most viable choice followed by on a feminist level. And I think as African feminists in particular, we really believe that our stories are universal because they are specific. By telling the stories of African women, you are speaking to experiences that are not heard anywhere else. That I know that as a global South, as a woman in the global South, my experiences are likely to connect to a woman in Peru in ways that I can't even imagine from where I'm sitting. So um, we really wanted to fundamentally prove that even on a commercial level, that these stories are universal. So that's when the Lamb Sisterhood Limited began. And in terms of our general discoveries during this process, we found that the biggest thing, and I think probably my biggest takeaway from this will be that your process matters just as much as your output. How you get the work happening will reveal your intention. So for us, we essentially have three arms, which is teaching, tailoring, and telling. So teaching involves us doing workshops sharing our skill set. And these skills are unique because, because of our African feminist approach. As for example, we have a workshop on collaborate, collaborative life writing, because while we were writing the play, we had to figure out how do we, as a group of three women, tell the story of a historical woman whose records may or may not exist and make it a pleasant enough process because we're funding it ourselves that we wanted to keep going for months and months and months on end. And so we discovered some tools around collaborative write, life writing that we've now taught at Harvard, uh, not Harvard, sorry, at NYUAD, at Stanford, at the African Leadership University, at the Aga Khan University, unique, a unique process that was formed through these feminist techniques. So if you're speaking about decoloniality, I think I'm leaning on reaching out to civil service actors who've done the work to teach you how they did the work is a really valuable way to get people involved. Number two, when it comes to tailoring, um, we love working with organizations who don't necessarily assume that there's a feminist angle in what they're trying to make, but are looking to tell stories or use storytelling to meet a specific need. So for example, we worked with an organization called the Pomoja Institute in Canada, when they were trying to talk to East African communities at the height of the pandemic, 
because Black and East African communities were not getting vaccinated. In Scarborough, which is one of the poorest counties there, there was a really high um, infection rate. So when they reached out to us, we developed a character using my actual voice called Auntie Betty, because we wanted somebody who sounded like those people you're speaking to, who understood how and why to speak to them and what was wrong with the messaging that the public, that the government was giving out. And that eventually became a very successful chatbot that was adopted by Johns Hopkins. I mean, that kind of had a lot of impact around the communications then. And our last arm is um, teach, it's uh, sorry, it's telling. So this is creating original stories that we really love and believe in. Our strongest example of that right now is Cabrazen, which again, it's not stories that are for African women. These are stories for all children of African descent. And this is children below 10, but it tells stories of African women in kind of folkloric ways. So taking real stories and making them into that kind of mythical folktale, leaning on our African traditions of that folktales are very memorable. If you want something to stick in a child's head, telling a folktale is effective. And if you want something that helps women on this continent and certainly globally, helping them take care of their children is a huge impactful metric. So our experience in feminist storytelling to kind of summarize it is that um, by focusing not just on the output, how do we get more stories of women, but by focusing on the process, how do we engage people who are telling these stories? How do we get them to teach us how to tell the stories? How do we pay them to work with us? How do we imbue this inside every single process from concept to completion? That's created the kind of most high impact quality output and as a worker in that space, some of the spaces that feel the most friendly and enjoyable to work in. Those are the spaces that I wanna go back to over and over again and don't mind sharing my knowledge and expertise and time because it doesn't feel extractive. It always feels additive if you're including people in the process from the beginning. I think that's the answer to your question. I hope I answered it and I'll hand it back to you. Yes, thank you so much, Anne, for not only sharing how powerful storytelling is and the importance of keeping the stories authentic and grounded in local context. Um, and you've also touched on some of the approaches you've used, as well as some of the ways that you've managed to reshape some harmful narratives. Um, I want to highlight on just because you've talked of impact on how replicable and scalable your approaches have been. And I don't think people know, but I think they would be very, very amazed to know that you've reached 300 communities and over 10,000 children have had access to your stories. Um, and that that's amazing. Um, so thank you, Anne, for sharing. That was very insightful. Um, I am going, this brings me to Pamina, and I want to touch on innovative approaches to development cooperation, primarily in terms of MNE. So when discussing power shift, a general call to action is for actors to rethink measurement and evaluation approaches, which are so often unfit for purpose. How has everyday peace indicators endeavored to confront these barriers and try to change practices that were once considered standard? And if you could also give us some lessons learned on how organizations MNE can prioritize meaningful engagement in dialogue with communities. Thank you, Adriana. Um, and um, thank you uh, to the International Civil Society Center and Partos for the invitation to join this great panel um, and also for putting together um, this uh, exciting innovation report. Um, so my name is Pamina Fersho. Um, I know we did introductions, but I wanted to add that besides being the founding executive director of Everyday Peace Indicators, I'm also a professor of coexistence and conflict resolution at the Heller School for Social Policy at the University of Brandeis um, outside of Boston, um, Brandeis University is in Waltham, Massachusetts. And I add that detail because I think it's important context to understand why and how um, we do what we do at Everyday Peace Indicators. Um, and to describe myself, um, I am a light-skinned woman with a blue shirt um, and short hair. Um, so, uh, so one of the biggest challenges for localization and monitoring and evaluation um, is that it's usually experts, program managers, donors, and staff, 
the, most of the people who are here in this Zoom call um, that are the ones who actually decide what indicators um, are used to track and monitor programming um, and therefore guide what programs will look like. Um, and it's not the people for whom we're actually trying to measure impact and outcome um, that are involved in that process. Um, so our goal um, at Everyday Peace Indicators is to move forward with measuring what matters um, and not just data collection. Um, so we developed Everyday Peace Indicators in order to um, include people that we're saying something about in the design of the tools we use to measure them. So indicators um, are tools to produce statistics, to produce numbers, um, and rarely, as I said, um, are the people that we're then actually saying something about with those statistics or numbers um, part of the process of creating those tools um, to actually generate that information and that data. Um, so what Everyday Peace Indicators does is um, kind of flip that on its head and include everyday people in the process of creating those tools and cre creating the indicators. And um, we can use Everyday Peace Indicators to guide programming uh, using those indicators developed by communities. Um, we use them um, also to establish activities, outcomes, impact according to local standards. Um, and um, they also allow us to capture unexpected needs and outcomes, which are often difficult to capture with standard ind indicators. Um, and they also allow us to inform advocacy and policy making because some indicators can speak to um, organizing communities, galvanizing communities, for example, to arrive at um, a consensus, right? Communities are not homogenous entities. Um, they are lots of different dis different uh, opinions and disagreements. So it's also a consensus building tool. Um, so what is EPI? It's a systematic methodology um, that I co-developed um, and that we now use at the Everyday Peace Indicators nonprofit um, to capture community-generated indicators of peace or other difficult to define social concept, concepts like justice or coexistence. So these slippery, difficult to define concepts, um, it's a process of being able to you include the community in defining those and then ultimately measuring them. We find and we use the process at a very local level. Um, we find that the more local we get, the more, um, quality indicators we produce, the more of a narrative and a story we can tell. Um, and uh, as researchers, we can always code and therefore scale up and generalize, but we can never get at that local detail that communities only have the knowledge um, to give us. So when we um, work with communities, we spend a lot of time defining what that means, what does it mean to be a community, um, and what are the boundaries? Um, typically we work with communities geographically. Um, so either a town within a town, neighborhoods in a town or um, a village. Uh, but sometimes we also define communities as people who have shared everyday realities. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of the methodology, just to say that it involves um, focus groups, um, verification and voting processes um, with, with community-wide participation. Um, and then there's also coding analysis um, and some mm, also design of programming in that third step. And then the fourth step um, is like any other indicator um, process where you're collecting data over time. So that could be in log frames or it could be in surveys or any other kind of longitudinal data collection to track change over time. So um, the innovation report also highlights GAM, uh, the grounded accountability pro uh, model. Um, the EPI process can be quite rigorous. Um, it, it means um, that it takes time and money. Um, so we've also uh, worked to develop what called the Grounded Accountability Model, or GAM, 
uh, with um, a peace building or, uh, civil society organization called Search for Common Ground um, and a donor um, called Humanity United, um, and along with two Colombian NGOs, Minga and Kosurka, uh, to find ways to allow civil society organizations to also produce and use community generated indicators. So GAM is what we call the adaptation of EPI for civil society design and monitoring use. So what we do is we will train individuals and organizations to adapt EPI for their own needs and capacities. And then we accompany that adaptation process. Um, and then that adaptation sort of, you know, when it goes, goes out into the world, it becomes GAM. And we also have a community of practice um, where uh, different organizations share lessons learned. Um, and that allows organizations to learn from EPI, but also to e adapt EPI so that they're able to use community generated indicators in their own work. Um, and it's really changed um, this organization's approach to indicators. Um, so just quickly to give you, and I know my time is up, um, some examples. Um, in a women's empowerment program, this is a search for common ground. Um, uh, instead of using um, conventional government in MEL indicators, this was a, a search for common ground women's empowerment program. And I'm reading these from um, a publication on GAM that we co-published with Search for Common Ground in Harvard University's Negotiation Journal. Um, so here's I'm just going to give you two examples of conventional MEL indicators. Percent of women political and civil society leaders who can clearly identify at least three requirements for and three constraints to their participation in the peace building and reconciliation process, economic growth, and addressing gender-based violence. Second one, percent of women political and civil society leaders that report an increase in confidence in their ability to advance the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, in contrast, uh, they use localized indicators. Um, and here are a few examples. Women leaders know how to write proposals for grants. Women leaders are able to diffuse tense situations. Women are able to secure more funding from organizations for the community's lead, uh, needs. Women leaders start home gardening groups with 100 and more families, et cetera. So you can see how concrete and specific and grounded these indicators are in relation to you know, our traditional approaches to indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Pamina, so much. That was very insightful. Um, and you've touched on representation. And I, I really like what you said about it, not just being data collection, but actually telling stories that matter. Um, and it's safe to say that the EPI methodology is one that can easily be adapted and tailored to certain very complex um, environments as well as social fabrics and doing so in a participatory and culturally sensitive way. So um, in keeping, um, in being mindful of time, I'm going to move on to Gloria to shift our focus a bit on participatory funding models and so, Gloria, um, we see commonly now funders attempting to address power imbalances in the sector, mainly um, from a programmatic perspective, but funding still lags when it comes to inequalities in the sector, particularly for LGBTQI people and sex workers. So could you tell us a bit about Uhai's journey in trying to pioneer innovative funding approaches that empower activists through participatory grant making. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gloria Mgarekazi. I am a black woman wearing my hair down. Uh, it's gray in color, and I am wearing glasses. Um, yeah, with the pink peach <laughs> shirt, uh, I think, yeah. Uh, so, I would like to start by premising the conversation that is ongoing and for this powerful, important research that much as we continue to see um, limited funding in the LGBTQI sex workers uh, movements, uh, we have noted that this is not just um, for the communities that we serve, but it has been a structural and systemic um, issue that has been ongoing for a while. Uh, especially when it comes to global south movements across the board. 
I, I think we continue to see limited funding that is going to movements within the global south. And there has been several reports that have uh, indicated that. And I also believe that this report has indicated that extensively. And more so even when it comes to feminist movements where there's intersections of LGBTQ persons, sex workers, gender diverse persons, uh, we see that there has been um, a significant amount of uh, exclusion and only about seven, I mean, only less than 10% of the global funding uh, goes to feminist movements that are composed of uh, LGBTQI persons and sex workers and marginalized persons. And so when it comes to Uhai, uh, Uhai's approach, Uhai was first of all founded in 2009 uh, by a group of activists uh, from uh, East Africa and Africa who recognized and realized that this exclusion has been ongoing for a while uh, and more so for LGBTQI sex worker movements uh, within, um, within, the, within the continent, but also within uh, the entire global um, South positioning of where the movements are. A bit about Uhai. Um, Uhai Ishri was founded in 2009, and we have been op we operate across seven countries within East Africa. That is Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, Tanzania, um, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and DRC. And just by realizing that that those are some of the really complex and unique context that we operate in because of um, other political, social, economic issues that um, that make up the, the region that we are from, which is East African region. And so by recognizing that that already is an existing factor that is going to, that has been limiting most of the sex worker movements and, and LGBTQ persons to access resources, Uhai was very intentional that from the beginning and all the processes that Uhai undergoes through are participatory um, in their way and um, are inclusive of activists within uh, the movement and from the communities. And so over the years, we've seen a growth. We've made over 1,000 grants to over 700 plus partners across the board. And and to speak a bit more about the participatory grant making model, this again, it um, has been uh, the way in which UHI operates from decision making internally, but also to external um, decision making and distribution of resources. Uh, so UHI is comprised of a, a, a committee that is from the movement across the seven countries that sits and advises Uhai on so many of the processes in terms of decision-making, uh, reviewing proposals, um, determining uh, how much should be moved to which part of the region, uh, again, depending on the context and the arising needs from the different movements. So recognizing that, that in, in and of itself, resource distribution has to be guided by activists within a cross movement, we have seen that as um, a non-thematic funder, we have seen that uh, we have seen that um, all of our resourcing and our support has been purely and continuously informed by the decisions and the priorities that have been identified by the different people. Um, and to also speak more about our philanthropic advocacy as well, Uhai has been and is part of different uh, spaces for donors and bilateral funders and, and state funders, you said, um, the Dutch ministry and other, other bilateral funders that has, and Uhai has continuously to inform uh, how resources should be moved because again of our unique positioning in within the region and the fact that um, these our processes are informed by activists. So we're able to share um, lived experiences that are contextualized that inform how resources are moved. Um, also to add on participatory grant making models, one of the key things that we have continuously done is ensuring that uh, we are accountable to our movements. And I think this moves away from the traditional accountability models that are usually top down or you know traditional um, grantee reports to the funder. But um, our, our, our processes in terms of knowledge generation, research, uh, organizational development, um, movement assessment development 
and all the learning hubs that we have um, convened are informed um, and led by our communities. And that is a key, uh, I would say that that is a key recipe for participatory grant making. You want to ensure that all, all processes are, are informed and you're involving the, the partners and the people in the communities that you're working with. And you're constantly sharing information, being accountable, being transparent, um, and continuously also affirming community agency by um, by taking on the solutions that are informed by the communities and the committees that have been formed. Um, to also conclude, uh, one of the ways in which we continue to resource the movement is uh, continuously strengthening the capacity of movements. And this is across the board from leadership, Again, realizing that most of the communities that we work with are heavily criminalized in all the countries that we are working in. Um, there are bills and laws and policies that exist to uh, marginalize and exclude the communities that we work with. And so being intentional about creating space for learning, for growth, for movement building, and not just within the region, but even um, opening up space by leveraging our access and our resources to global global advocacy spaces and learning spaces where our our partners and our movement has continuously to engage and we see that that has uh, contextually shifted a lot of things for the movement because of that access to spaces to be able to inform processes but to also uh, push back on some of the harmful ways that uh, continuously come from global north to global south um, methods of working um yeah, and, and that's how, in summary, we have supported the movement through participatory grant making. Just to say that grant make, participatory grant making comes a lot with uh, participation. And I think that's the key thing to uh, take note of. And that participation has to be throughout the entire processes, not at only at a particular decision making level, but throughout the entire process so that the people are able to uh, inform the different structures and how they affect them and how uh, they can also co-create solutions that are going to uh, respond to some of the key issues that have been identified. So I'll stop there and back to you, Adriana. Thank you, Gloria, so much for that. So you've talked a lot about, from all of your contributions, Gloria and Pamina, you all talked about making space for participation, whether it be from marginalized communities, um, grassroots organizations and really centering in on their ability to make decisions and to be fairly represented. And so essentially, we've talked about shifting power or rather reclaiming power, whether it be through that fair representation, fostering leadership within communities and equitable partnerships. So we focused in on a lot on locally led initiatives and restoring power to communities and people that are too often marginalized. And so my next question is actually for all of you, and I will ask you to give us a one minute to two minute answer. What are some important voices that are not part of the innovation conversation yet, but that definitely should be? We can start in, in the same pattern, and if you'd like to go first. Um, important voices not in the conversation. I would say, it's one of the, I'm, I struggle with that question because it's one of those things that's like everybody or <laughs> I feel like that feels like the answer. Um, I uh, the From our perspective, I think a gap we found, I'll just speak from our experience, has been, um, like I mentioned in the beginning, we straddle a really specific space where we are in the entrepreneurship sector by law, doing impact by work. And aren't and are explicitly feminist, um, which kind of creates kind of some walls in terms of accessing both funding capital as well as commercial capital. So to keep the ethics as well as the, I think there's a lot of people who are doing some incredible work, including here in Kenya. There's organizations like Paukwa. There's a great animation company called Udi and Tata's Nursery Rhymes, which has actually started a Kickstarter, that are doing some really interesting, creative, and collaborative work around um, activist activist work, I would argue, that I think tend to kind of disappear in these conversations when they have the potential to have real economic impact in their spaces, as well as um, social impact. And uh, last I'd say is 
I'd also say like kind of educated voices are very heavily overrepresented. Um, we do a lot of work with youth and community and what we found is, and I fundamentally believe everybody understands story on a root level, like it's a human basic, like breathing, you just know it. The gap is, the challenge has always been, how do we get people to say their stories in a way that everybody else finds compelling? And it's very easy to do the work and say, I am, you know, I'm listening to the voices and communicating it. How do you integrate your processes well enough such that you are truly a vehicle for someone's story, not the storyteller, not the creator, but a vehicle for the people who have stories to say and actively do work that engages and connects with them on a deeper and non-extractive level. I think often you'll hear stories that from personal experience that um, have been curated, let's say, for, for the audience that knows what it needs. They want certain sob stories, they want certain information. So you curate, the audience curates that content for you. So how do you get past that and actually get to a truth without being extractive or harmful? Because you're not gonna be there once you go. Um, that I think means a lot of marginalized voices, especially undereducated ones, which don't have the articulation, quote unquote, to communicate the way we are, um, don't get heard. Yeah. Um, Amina, I see your mic is unmuted. Yeah, pop in, yes. go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'm... <laughs> uh, no, I was just, I uh, was echoing what Anne said. I absolutely agree. Um, uh, and wish that we had more space and time to talk about this because um, it's so important. You bring up so many important points. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's really, it's not necessarily about like who or what are, what, what important voices are not part of it. I mean, um, it, it's more about, you know, um, I, I guess listening versus hearing, um, and really, um, engaging, um, rather than just, um, maybe, um, having some, a cursory contact or or um, some you know small engagements um, or potentially um, doing you know a small funding um, project pro funding a small project or fun giving a small amount of funding um, to maybe m put towards innovative um, projects or innovative ways of doing things and then kind of abandoning it to move on to the next thing to the next. Um, uh, thing that's in fashion essentially for the development community, right? Um, so, so I think really like, I guess, sticking with innovation, um, I think is really important because, um, it, uh, it's really, it's necessary to, um, sustain these efforts over time rather than just try them out once and then, um, move on. Um, just one other point that I had written down was that I think also um, there's a lot of potential um, in bringing people together from the global north and the global south. I know somebody had an issue with this terminology in the chat. I'm happy to talk about that too. But um, but you know there's a lot of issues that I see in the United States um, that I also see in my work. I mean. Uh, there's not space to talk about it, but even just like transitional justice, like let's choose reparations, for example, right? These are issues that we're struggling with in the United States, and they're issues that we work on in the development community. So, um, so, so bringing these sectors together, um, if you know, let's say in the global north, the violence prevention, the poverty reduction. Um, the justice or social justice, the social services sectors, then with international development um, and peace building, et cetera. Um, that's, I think, a space that still um, could use a lot more um, development. Yeah, um, I think that those are really important um, sharings that we've had and that you've all shared. I think when it comes to who is not on the table or who who is missing in the conversation is also a question that I usually struggle with because I also think that um, as we're thinking about innovation, uh, we have to start thinking about reimagining innovation and how that uh, particular framing might also be excluding most people because I do believe that sometimes 
in language, language is very powerful because it's important for us to name and belong. And I also um, understand and I have seen that language sometimes boxes in and boxes out. Uh, and so just being very keen on framing what innovation is and what it looks like for different people with different contexts and different lived realities. And so perhaps in this case, um, again, just uh, making sure that when we are framing uh, the wording and the and the naming around innovation, we're not excluding people who are doing what they should be doing, which in their own terms is innovation. Um, and so that aspect of political listening and just being able to ground yourself within the community uh, led and, and, and founded initiatives and solution and taking that as innovation without having to necessarily, um, I guess, reframe the language that uh, should fit a certain um, language or model or thematic area that um, um, we have been seeing as a trend. And I would also say really just being keen on uh, South to South collaborations or as someone said, global majority collaborations. I think that uh, we, we have to continuously think of how issues across the board, issues in Latin America, in, in the US, in Europe, in South Africa, in the East, in the North, uh, they're all interconnected. And how do we as a people who are um, usually affected major by the majority of these issues, how are we working together, how are we thinking together, how are we creating that space to say that these are our innovations and this is what we wanna take forward and this is how we think that uh, these political, social, economic issues should be referred according to our ex experiences and also our expertise being within the communities. And, and I believe that that is going to create such an intersectional approach that does not only recognize um, one particular group of people to be more important or more at risk than the other, but, but having a, a multi-sectoral approach that covers across, across the board. And I say this also thinking about how the framing for LGBTQI persons and sex workers, for example, has been mainly around health, HIV, and so most of the funding and the resources that are available are being channeled into that, uh, forgetting that these are full human beings that need to go to school, need to pay for their healthcare, need to uh, that have a family, need to feed their family, um, and, and only focusing on one particular model that is speaking to, uh, I guess, what I would call, quote unquote, a global priority, which in this case may be health. So just being able to affirm people's full autonomy and agency and understanding that communities, locally led initiatives, these people do understand their problems and issues. And, and, and so in saying, they do also understand the solutions and how to go about those problems. Um, and I think that as even we go along uh, the, the conversation of innovation and how uh, to build a system to be better, we have to be as accessible as possible so that we're not leaving out uh, people who are living with disabilities in all their intersections um, so that they're able to also uh, uh, as well participate in these conversations. In the interest of time, I'll share those for now. Back to you. Thank you all so much. Um, this is such an interesting conversation. I think it's so unfortunate that we don't have more time to explore these different themes. And I really love how, no matter how different um, your work is and how different your backgrounds are across civil society, you all tie back together in the work that you do, whether it is um, equipping people in communities to find that autonomy and to empower them and foster their leadership. Um, and it's it's very interesting that you've talked also about um, how people in the communities are actually best positioned to um, provide solutions to their problems. And I think that it says a lot about redefining the concept of expertise and who the experts are. And although this is a grand topic that could be an entirely different conversation, I'm so happy that you each touched on that, whether it's through media, through storytelling, or through the m and &E processes and the tools, and um, having flexible funding available for, for 
everyone. So thank you for that. Um, and now we're going to take a few minutes to answer a few questions that have come in, in the chat. So I know at the beginning, Miriam has encouraged everyone to submit in their questions through the chat. And this is the time to take a few of them. OK, so we have a first question for you, Anne. And the question reads, I would like to ask if you personally have a background in the arts and when and how you realize that the arts can be used as a powerful medium and approach to create change. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, my history, like every writer in Kenya, I'm a, I'm a failed attempted lawyer. I did my law degree and I was like, oh, that's done. <laughs> so when that ended, I was like, I talk a lot, I write a lot, what can I do? Writing, art, performance felt like a very natural fit and almost like a self, a rediscovery of self rather than a new ideation. Um, and so I just kind of started with just trying to figure out so doing spoken word and clubs, that kind of thing, just trying to understand what my position was in storytelling. And about a year or two later, I discovered kind of feminist communities and deeper feminist work and slightly more academic spaces. Local Kenyan spaces were doing some incredible things. And in that time, I found that for myself, the kind of clearest fit across the board has been um, using stories to, to create change in some way, shape, or form. So I worked in the nonprofit sector for a long time, developing content around menstrual health for teenage girls, and did a bunch of kind of community-focused work before we started this company. And it's it's very intertwined, I think, and in some ways very selfish, like I think with most artists, I think there's no, I want to have the world that I want to live in, you know? And one the only way I can contribute to it that I know I can is through storytelling. I want my nephews to have the world that I want them to live in. And the way I can contribute that to that is through storytelling. That's that's my skill, that's my calling. So I think my journey started from just a complete sense of loss and then discovering art and then discovering feminism and finally understanding that the two are not distinct, that if anything, they are more connected than I ever imagined. Beautiful, thank you for sharing so honestly. Um, we have another question, and it's actually for all of you, so please feel free to hop in. Um, the question reads, I would be interested to know how these initiatives have managed to link up with other like-minded organizations to create a movement of local civil society organizations to represent local practitioners as equal partners internationally, like shifting the power movement. I could go first. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so speaking from my experience and my position being at Ohai Ishri, uh, one of the ways in which we continue to build transnational movement um, relations and collaborations is creating space for activists and movement from across the region, much as we're based and focused in East Africa, which is also where um, uh, and is coming from Kenya and other countries within the East African region. We are very aware that most of these issues are the same across the board. And I think as we've continued to see, there's such a rise in the anti-gender and anti-rights movement across the board, coming from um, all the way from the US, all the way to where we are right now in, in Uganda, in Burundi, and in DRC, and many other countries. And just being able to recognize that all these forces are intertwined. Um, and we as well need to be very intentional about our collaboration. So having movements from South Africa, having partners from West Africa, uh, where we continue to see uh, bills that are discriminatory cropping up and just sitting together and creating space of how do we how do we push back, but also really thinking and pushing with um other global like a, like a, like minded organizations that are within the global south are having partners across within say for example the us that um adequately have access to resources and the space but i would also like to say that ohai has established uh, a space a convening which is called changing faces uh changing spaces that happens every well, it, it used to happen every year, but because of COVID, we kind of moved away from that. So it happened 
um, biannually, and now uh, that space brings activists and movements from across the continent, and not just um, not just uh, African led or East African led, just uh, across the continent, uh, people that are fighting and working every day to advance human rights and to make spaces uh, for for communities that we serve, and we have seen that those that kind of that particular space has created um, immense collaboration. Like having someone from Uganda or from Ethiopia meeting someone from. Djibouti, for example, or Cape Town, and just realizing that they're all living and fighting more, more or less are the same issues, that the only separation is just the colonial borders that are separating us, but issues are the same across the board, and really coming up with solutions and thinking together, basically, and coming up with solutions and frameworks and tools that sort of empower us, because um, I do believe that when we're having a more coordinated and such a bigger voice, then we're able to move impact across, whether we're using storytelling, we're using advocacy, we're using litigation, too bad you left the field, and <laughs> but it's very stressful, I understand. So just being able to um, use all our resources and all our capacities and expertise across the board to inform uh, the ways in which we can create a better world for the communities that we live in and, and work with. Great. Um, does anyone want to add to what Gloria said? No? I can give some examples from the grounded accountability model, um, but also happy to move on to the next question. Okay. Um, actually, the next question I think would be very interesting to you, Pamina, since you've talked about terminology um, earlier. Um, the next question, again, is for all of you. So even if Pamina answers, feel free to add in your contributions. The question reads, I find it interesting that all the presenters are using the terms global south and global north rather than majority and minority words. Why do they prefer this framing? Happy to take a stab. <laughs> um... Uh, so the majority and minority framing, um, I'm less familiar with, so that's why I say I'm taking a stab. Um, but to me, um, the, the global north and global south terminology comes from, um, like the liberal paradigm, right? Um, sort of the global north imposing its structures on the global south and telling it what to do, and <laughs> sort of... <laughs> Um, dynamic, right? And that's, I think, what we're trying to describe when we use that terminology, um, that it this should be um, a joint, a global venture, rather than um, one where um, there's half of the, or maybe not even half the world, but um, where, I guess, you know, uh, those in power with the money are imposing um, their uh, priorities on um, those that are trying to emerge um, and um, and maybe you know in in my context um, work through conflict or war or, um, and emerge out of that um, into a transition to peace. Gloria and do you have some thoughts you'd like to share? Sure mine will be very brief. Um, the person who <laughs> asked the question I'll be very honest. I don't have a framework for that choice. I think I began by saying global south. I have used both of those terms interchangeably. And that's frankly like a lack of knowledge on my part. I think I know significantly more about story structure <laughs> and can give you a list of options than I am between the distinction and the frameworks behind those two thinkings. So like in asking the question, you pointed out something in my lack of knowledge. So I'm like, oh, that's something I'm gonna do a little bit more research on to make a more informed decision. That said, um, in local context here, we've used both interchangeably. It tends to vary a little bit between audiences, but they neither have seemed harmful compared to, for example, less developing and more economically developed, which is an ancient framework that no one uses anymore. I don't have much to add, but just to say that uh, both words or both, both framing, um, again, comes from I think wanting to create a distinction between uh, the people that have more access, that are having um, majority of the decision making, even when they don't have quote, like what I would call the expertise, but also just to say that perhaps some 
and this is also, uh, I think, something that we have to start interrogate as people within the civil society. Uh, how are we, again, making sure that framing and language is not boxing in and boxing out, but also we are not uh, moving, uh, uh, like we're not abandoning up issues and people within these huge words that sort of like take away people's identity and humanity. And I think because I say that because the glo global South or majority, global majority is not a homogeneous um, sort of like identity. M much as we are identifying with these words and this framing, we have different issues, we come with different identities, we come with different language, we come with different contexts. So sometimes when we um, use such in, in important words, sometimes again, we want to belong, we want to find an identity, we have to be very, very critical to make sure that these are not eroding our people's humanity and identity and uniqueness and innovation and context. Uh, but while holding space for how do we also, um, I guess, uh, create a movement, how do we belong with each other, how do we, with all those um, diverse identities and things that describe who we are, we have also these shared challenges, these shared identities, so how do we belong, how do we come into a community? I saw someone asking, how do we build a movement like Shift the Power Movement? Because we need to kind of do that. So I think that that's where the framing for me comes from. Or that's how I look at it when I'm approaching it from Global South or Global Majority or that kind of framing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that that terminology does have a lot of contradiction. And it's it's been heard over and over again in so many conversations. Um, I think in this context, whether it is taken because of geographical re reasons or governance reasons uh, is debatable. But in our case, because we are talking about innovation um, and innovation from communities that are often marginalized or represented as um, or generally depicted as just beneficiaries, we tend to use the term global south to kind of globalize that group of people that is so misrepresented and i think that that might be a frame why these words were used in this conversation although also it is debatable and um yeah i, I think that more will be said about this in the report and i think people will be very interested to read the report and find out more about the specific work that all of you have been doing um we are unfortunately headed towards the end of our panel, but I have one final rapid fire question for all of you. And it is, what is one key takeaway or message that you would like to share to everyone who has joined us today? Feel free to unmute and go for it. I'm sure I can go. Um, so one message to take away. So our work is all about making African women feel seen, heard and beloved. And the biggest thing we have learned, regardless of your audience, regardless of what marginalization or lens that you're speaking towards or using, the, pro the biggest lesson has been your process is as important as your output. What you have in the room from the moment your idea is conceived is as important as what you hand over in the end. As a storyteller, even outside of this work, I can promise you, your audience can always feel it. As a technical, as a technician in the space, I can see why they can tell. But most people don't know why they can see, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel authentic, but they do feel it, they do know it. And that always comes through in your process. So um, we always begin, for example, with a visioning. Every project, regardless of if it's client, if it's our own work, if it's working for somebody else, we always start with a vision. Everybody in the room, what is your vision for this work? And that's what we hold ourselves internally accountable to in our process. If you don't do that step, and we've gone through a lot of pain in this, if you don't do that step, you find yourselves in conflict, you find that your visions are not aligned, or you find that you make a product that isn't true to the vision of the community that you're serving. So I'd really say, emphasize that, make sure your process is solid, inclusive, make sure that the process itself considers decoloniality. Are you paying your collaborators? Are you accounting for their time? Are you accounting for the power balance that you have or don't have with the person that you're working with? Like all of these things add up to make a process that's 
very effective and I found extremely productive and high quality. Once again, I I echo what Ann says. I um yeah, I I love uh, your contributions um and also Gloria's. Um I, I would say, um, I mean, just, you know, coming from the presentation that I'm giving, um, become data literate, um, understand what data means, understand what it means to be, um, to meaningfully use data. Um, no, don't just take labels like evidence-based or data-driven uh, for granted. Um, and, and, you know, understand that different kinds of data can be used for different purposes. Um, and it's not enough to just gather data. Um, I think that in this space, we are constantly trying to um, gather more data faster um, in order to be able to prove that, you know, we somehow are objectively doing something good. Um, and, uh, and, and that um, equation um, needs to be unpacked um, and it needs to um, really be um, looked at in, in much more detail um, and thought through. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, it's better to do, um, you know, less, um, but in more depth. Uh, and I think that's something that we've really learned is that we've spent, you know, uh, the, we see oftentimes um, pushback on our work because it's so localized and we're working at the community level. And a lot of international organizations, or in my case, political scientists say, yeah, okay, great, but what can you say about a region or a country? Um, and, uh, and, and, and there's always this need for scaling up and for saying something about or engaging or measuring or defining for a larger swath of people or um, um, or communities. Um, and, you know, sometimes less is more. So uh, become data literate and understand the complexities of uh, using methods and um, collecting data for development. Thank you both. Uh, I think that those are great. And the beauty about speaking last is sometimes you don't have to repeat the uh, amazing things that have been shared. I think for me, I'll just say that as we leave this conversation, one of the key things that I would want us to go forward with is listening, practicing the skill and the practice and the politic of listening. Um, to be able to act. I know that we have spoken a lot about like, participation grant making, but I do believe that participation is invalid if we are not listening. So it becomes then tokenistic and extractivist, extra, extractivism led. Um, so I would just want to retaliate some of the things that we've been saying earlier, how uh, we must listen to learn, we must listen to engage, and we must listen to also act, because that is what then forms uh, participation, that is what forms uh, engagement of communities, self-determination, and all these things that we are truly fighting and working towards. Um, and so when we're in communities and um, they are telling us that this won't work because of the different um, context and the experiences that they have. We should not be imposing our ways because it has worked in country A, then it must work in country B. So we must have to recognize that, that listening is, is as important as the work that we're taking forward as or, um, uh, the thematic area or whatever we're focusing on. Um, without listening, I, I do believe that we are we're leaving out a lot of people. We're leaving out a lot of innovation, and 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 I think that for us to again continuously uh, be able to uplift community engagement and 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 self determination, we have to be able to take away what we are being told in good faith, in being transparent, trusting that these people and these communities know best and they're experts and they know what they should do and just taking that and and being 
very, very comfortable and confident in that without again imposing other stringent ways of like, oh, so report to us, or this is how you're going to report to us because again, these are our you know structures and processes. So just being able to move away from centering, uh, especially if you're a funder, if you're a donor, if you're a partner that is working with communities, decentering uh, yourself is very important while listening and centering communities that are working every day to find these solutions to the issues that they face on a daily. Yeah. Thank you, Gloria, for sharing. Um, because we have a few minutes left, I, I want to end this with a call to action and a call to action towards international civil society organizations. So what would be one thing you would ask or that would be needed from ICSOs to push forward the work that all of you have been doing? I would say flexibility and trust for communities. That's all that's all we need. That's all we need. We know best, but yes, I'll say that. Great. Thank you. Um, Pamina and no contributions. Sure. A hundred percent flexibility and trust. That was great. I was just clapping great. and forgot to zoom call. Fully agree. Um and I would add, um, to be very frank, like hire people, <laughs> like hire people. I think there's a lot of, specifically if you're working in feminist spaces, there's a lot of assumptions that feminist work is nonprofit work. And while that's not inherently incorrect, it is labor and labor should be compensated. So even as you're thinking through what that means, if you're an organization with the power and the budgets, even what seems small to you in the global South hiring, plus it's actually very frankly easier. Having been on both sides, being paid by a client is significantly simpler and creates better outputs than being paid than dealing with the grant making, as Gloria mentioned, of an NGO. Um, we did yeah. some incredible work with Mega Can Foundation for the Learning Hub. Um, called TISA, a whole universe of stories, multimedia. And their ap approach was the first time we've ever been hired by an INGO to develop original content, hired, not granted, to develop original content in with three different companies. And what that enabled was wild. So I would tell CSOs, think about that in your budgets. What would it take to hire them as equals? Even on a philosophical level, hiring says, I trust your expertise. Nonprofits sometimes, not always, but sometimes indicate, I think I am giving you a gift. And it's a very different conversations. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, um, for me now, I'll ask you to keep it to one minute because we are going to wrap up. No, I mean, I can also just uh, leave it at that because I, I absolutely echo what Anna and Gloria said. I think... Um, uh, organizations need to um, realize what small small um, entities or movements um, can contribute and need to support that on an even level um, and uh, and not necessarily use it because again it's something that's in vogue um, and can get them you know the big grant um, so so I think you know really, coming up with meaningful partnerships that are equal um, and where um, CSOs or inter international CSOs really believe and want to uplift those organizations in a way or those movements or those groups, whatever it is, you know, um, uh, in a way that um, that supports them and sustains them into the future. I think that's really, really key. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your contributions, your thoughts, and for sharing your experience. I truly hope that everyone who has joined in will feel as inspired as I have and as excited to read the report, um, to delve deeper into your experiences and the other case studies. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your contributions. Uh, without further ado, I hand it back over to you, Miriam. Thank you, Adriana, and also for the uh, benefit of blind and visually impaired people. I will also self-describe myself. I'm a, I'm a black woman with uh, long braids uh, wearing a white and green shirt. 
So I really want to thank our brilliant panelists. Um, it has really been a privilege, I have to say, to be able to highlight the innovations of, of your organizations and now to hear you speak so passionately to them. Uh, and I think we touched upon so many interesting and much needed issues and that we will continue to pick on. There are little threads that continue to pick on around you know, expertise, who defines expertise around approaching the coloniality and the power of language. So we will continue touching on these issues as part of the discussions around the, the report, but also as part of our work around um, shifting power. I would also like to thank Adriana for masterfully guiding us through this uh, panel discussion and also adding so much of your own expertise uh, to this conversation. And uh, I just want to let you know that you will receive the report in a follow-up email and uh, you will be able to then read the case studies and to really hear more about the uh, innovations from the case studies organizations. Uh, and also we will continue to disseminate the case studies throughout the next weeks. So please, please keep an eye on our communication channels to, to hear more. Uh, then next week on 20th of May, we will have another learning event hosted by Partos where we will drill down in the recommendations and also engage with you as well in order to understand what are some of these uh, actionable steps that you can take in your organization. So please do not miss it. We have also added the uh, registration link in the chat. Uh, once again, I would like to thank all the center colleagues and partners colleagues for the support, uh, as well as our uh, partner in the research, Includivate. And thank you also all for joining and for being so engaging on this topic. We will continue with this discussion, so we really look forward to seeing you at the next center events. Thank you all.